Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. That's Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. And this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, with another Watchman video broadcast. Ahmadinejad, he's in the news. Again, you know, the I guess he's the president, prime minister, the king or something like that of Iran. I don't know what it is. But anyway, he is in the news again. And here we are having more talk of a new world order. This article from Press TV, I've never heard of him, so I don't know how reliable it is. Uh, but you see it there on the screen. Ahmadinejad called calls for new world order. Iranian President Mohammad or Mahmoud Ahmadinejad has called for a new world order based on new ideas saying the era of tyranny has come to a dead end. How, I don't know how many broadcasts that we're going to bring to you of somebody somewhere calling for a new world order. This thing is going to happen. We've talked about this in several broadcasts before. We've dealt with it in, in several videos that we've done through our ministry, prophetic research ministry, and it just seems like that everything that's shaping up now is rolling us into a new world order. And I promise you that once we get to that point, once we get to the point where there is going to be a new structure, a new order, a new world government, a new world religion, new world financial system, all of these things are rolling together at once. Once we get to that point, the process of taking us there, I promise you, is going to be a violent one. It's not going to, we're not going to wake up one morning and uh, find out that Congress passed a bill bringing us into a new world order. And we're just going to go, oh, well, this, this was easy. I promise you that it's going to be a very violent, um, very earth-shattering situation when this world is finally brought into a new world order. I think that the things that we see in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13, and other places in the scripture, I think it's that at that time that those things are going to come to fruition. Some Bible scholars say that they've already happened. Some say that they're going to have to happen after the rapture. Uh, and whatever you believe on that is fine. But I think that we're going to see the fruition of those things that Jesus warned about. Wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and pestilences and diverse places. I think those are going to be sort of the, um, the, uh, the changing point of bringing this whole world, especially this country, into a new world order. And it's just interesting that Ahmadinejad is talking about these things and he's sort of, uh, it sounds like he's promoting it. And I, and I guess according to this article, he is. Because we need to remember something. And, 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 and I don't want anybody to get the idea that from watching this broadcast that I think I have all the answers because I don't. There's a lot of things that are still very, very unclear to me. And if they're unclear to me, I'm not going to say, well, I think this is going to happen or this is definitely going to happen or thus saith the Lord. But one of the things that's interesting to me and interesting to those who are Bible prophecy students is that Iran is Persia. Iran is Persia. And uh, I want you to look at this verse up on the screen, Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. This was the angel that as Daniel was praying, this was the angel that came to him three weeks after Daniel began to pray. And he says to him, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. Now I understand that prince, I think that prince is Satan himself. I think that prince is Lucifer. And so here this angel is telling Daniel that there was this, there was this prince and of course, some scholars say, well, that was the king of Persia and so on and so on. But I'm going to show you from the scriptures that I think this prince was not just an earthly figure that was stood an angel. I think it was an angel itself. And I think it was the fallen angel, Lucifer, who withstood this angel for 21 days. In other words, this thing was so powerful that, that the angel could not get through to tell Daniel that there was an answer to his prayer. And if you see there at the end of the verse, but lo... Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. In other words, he had to get some help from Michael, the archangel. And this is the same Michael that was seen in Revelation chapter 12 who fought the dragon. And so it just looks like there's a little bit of, little bit of experience going on there. But anyway, the prince of Persia. And what you see in different places in the Bible, you look in Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. Uh, then he said, uh, or then said he, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that withholded with, with me in these things, but Michael, 
your prince. In other, now, we know that Michael was an angel, so it's reasonable to assume from the scriptures that the prince of Persia and the prince of Grecia were also angels. They were, are what the Bible refers to as principalities. They are angels that have a certain amount of din- dominion. And I think that the Bible's telling us that these angels have dominion over specific things here on this earth. So the prince of Persia, the prince of Grecia, the, the, the prince of Israel would be Michael. And the prince of Persia, I believe, was Lucifer, and he withstood this angel. And what I'm trying to say is, is that I think that this same prince, this same angel, this same demon, as you were, still holds a principal power or dominion over the land of Persia, which is now Iran, and it may be some other incorporated areas, I don't know. But anyway... This same demon is in operation today. That's why Iran is such a major player, I think, in things that pertain to the last days. And I think, and I think that, that Iran is going to be a dangerous situation somehow, some way, as we approach the last days. I don't know this to be true. Only God knows these things. And hopefully, and I believe that he will reveal these things as we move along, as the danger approaches, we're going to be standing as watchmen on the wall. And we're going to see when these things come to pass and warn people. But keep your eye on a ram. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, there it is, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And of course, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, Paul is telling us here, he's teaching us, he's telling us about how things really are. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm not in, in, in any immediate danger by Barack Obama, Henry Kissinger, or Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. These guys don't threaten me imminently when I wake up in the morning. When I wake up in the morning, I'm in, I'm in danger of being attacked by principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And if you were to be honest, if you're born again, you encounter those same things daily in your life. They are a threat to us. They are what we are wrestling with in these last days. And so this, this spirit of the Prince of Persia, I think is going to be a major player of things that are going to take place in the last day. So let's keep as watchmen, let's keep our eyes open, let's keep our ears open, let's keep our heart right with God so that we're able to see the things that are coming to pass. More economic news. Here is an uh, article from World Net Daily. Fed says economy even worse than thought. You see, they're trying to get this idea, and, and it may be bad. I know a lot of people that have lost their job. We've had some major restructuring here in our church, and I'll talk about that at the end of the broadcast. But uh, I, I believe that the economy is bad, and I believe that it's getting worse, but I believe that it's being manipulated by those who seek to gain power. Look at what the article said. Gloomy assessment as governments consider bank nationalization. That was the key right there to this whole thing. The economic outlook for the next two years is worse than expected, say Federal Reserve policymakers, who warn today the economy is contracting at a, quote, disturbing pace. In a speech at the National Press Club, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke pointed to dismal economic data, while other top Fed uh, official warned of the need for even more stimulus, even with the interest rates set near zero. Evidence of further economic gloom, the officials say, can be seen in figures showing a curtailment of big industry production in January and record low housing construction. I used to work in construction, and I'll tell you that when people are not buying houses and building houses, it has an effect. Meanwhile, governments worldwide, and here's the key right here, governments worldwide that already have poured billions of dollars into failing banks are considering seizing full control of financial institutions. And I'm telling you, and anybody with a brain can tell you, that that is exactly what this whole thing was about. It was set up to crumble. It was a house of cards built to fall down. What are you talking about? I'm talking about all this global economy. I'm talking about big businesses who, uh, who run massive, who run on massive amounts of debt. When you drive up and down the streets of your town and you see these big chain stores, whether they, the, the Home Depots or the Walmarts or the, uh, any of these other big chain stores, even restaurants, what you're seeing represented there is a lot of debt. 
These companies went into massive amounts of debt. They borrowed this money from banks. Banks, in turn, borrowed this money from other banks, from larger banks. And it's all crumbling down. It's all toppling down on top of them. And when, when one falls, all of the rest of them are failing. And all this was set up. It, like I said in a previous broadcast, I didn't do this. I didn't run up all this debt. I didn't spend all this money. I didn't go into all these financial dealings that are turning out bad. And most of you didn't either. It was set up so that it could fail, so that more control could, could be taking place. Here's what Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 13 says. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up. That is exactly what's going on in this country today. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And then he says in verse 17, And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And then he says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 33, The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation, which thou knowest not, eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway. You see, all of these things are coming about as a result of the wickedness, not only in the United States of America, but the wickedness around the world. That's where all of these things, that's why all of these things are happening, is that God said that I am the one who's going to give you wealth. I'm the one that's going to bless you. I'm the one that's going to take care of you. He feeds the birds. He feeds the cows. He owns all of these things. And I believe that God can feed us. I believe that God can do a better job than we're doing. I believe, that, I believe God can do a better job than Barack Obama can do it. But one of the things that we're seeing today is that we're seeing all of this wealth just crumbling down because it brought pride to mankind. And God said, you're going to have all this wealth, but I am going to bring a nation against you that's going to eat it all up. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. And all of this is moving toward, and you've heard a lot of talk lately about a cashless society over the last several years. And now we're moving toward that. Here's an article. Uh, from the BBC, dying checks, and you can tell it's from Britain because of the way they spell checks. Uh, dying checks mark changing times. Consumers in the UK should expect a revolution. Look at the term there. Expect a revolution in the way they pay for things in the near future, or according to Payments Association, APAX. I don't know what that is, but anyway. Uh, the check, which is 350 years old and on 16th of February, is said to be an irreversible decline as innovation points toward a cashless society. Banks will increasingly battle for a consumer to use one card exclusively. And we all know where this is headed. This is headed toward Revelation chapter 13. And he causes, both, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, so that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And I don't have a perfect understanding of that. I just know that at some point, as Bible prophecy students, we should have been expecting to see that there was going to be a constant move toward the globalization of all the world's economies and basically bringing every form of buying and selling into one central location so that it could be controlled. There is going to be one group of people who's going to decide who can buy and sell and who cannot. And it's going to be based upon how they mark everybody and how everybody is brought into the new world order. If you're born again, if you're saved, you won't take that mark. You say, well, Pastor Mike, I've heard that we're going to be raptured by then. Well, maybe so. But then again, Maybe not. Remember, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. We deal with that falling away on this broadcast and in our church ministry. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That day is not going to come until these things, I believe, until the Antichrist is manifest here on this earth. And I think those who are watchmen, I think those who are, who are born again, 
And I think those who really believe the Bible are going to be able to see this guy and, and we're going to know that he's not the real Jesus. He's the fake. He's the phony. And so be careful as we move into these last days because more and more control is going to be taken over the finances of this world. And what it's going to do is just going to bring everybody into a, force them into a position where they must take the mark simply to eat. But don't worry about that, Christians, because God knows how to feed his people. Amen. Here's more news. Police State USA, World Net Daily says, National Guard scraps plans to invade a rural town. This operation could be pretty intrusive to people, is the quote. From Des Moines, Iowa, following publicized reports that the Army National Guard was planning a military training exercise on the streets of a rural Iowa town, the commanding officers have called off the mock invasion. The Guard had planned a four-day urban military operation in tiny Arcadia, Iowa, population 443, sending troops to take over the town and search door-to-door for a suspected weapons Dealer. The exercise was designed as a mock scenario to give soldiers the skills needed for deployment in urban environment, which means your hometown. Listen, we've seen this coming for years. We know with all the things, and we've talked about internment camps on this broadcast, we've talked about all the laws that are in place right now, the executive orders and everything. You can expect that at some point we're going to see uh, military troops going through the streets of the towns that are around you and uh, these are not going to be just American troops. They're training American troops, but we also know for a fact that they're training foreign troops to do warfare inside of this country. We know that the army has pulled some 20,000 troops off of off the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan and brought them home, and it seems like they've done it for a reason. And so right now they're training and all, the, all these little urban centers in America, they're trained for urban warfare because at some point they're going to use them. Here's another article. Uh, I think this one is out of Louisiana. Louisiana, as some of them say down there. Bombs, choppers during military exercises startle residents. Residents in and around the Nolans have been here. That's how they say it down there, Nolans. Residents in and around New Orleans have been hearing the sounds of low-flying helicopters and what sounds like bomb blasts over the past few nights. But the sounds are a part of training exercises for some of America's elite military troops. And I've had some people suggest to me, and, and I think it could be true, that uh, they're getting us so used to seeing these exercises go on that when the real thing takes place that we, we won't be startled and we won't take much note of it. And I think that could very well be true. I appreciate all the emails that I get from people. And uh, uh, my, my inbox is just flooded every day as a result of this program. People are watching out. And I've got some good watchers out there. And, and uh, one of the things that I want to encourage people to do is I want you to be careful about what it is that you believe. Because I think that there are certain elements out there that are trying to push a New World Order agenda. But they're pushing it from the what I call the patriot side of it. Uh, I think that there are people out there who are called agent provocateurs. They are working secretly on the inside and they're trying to provoke people to do certain things. And so with that in mind, uh, a guy sent me an email and it was a link to a video. And we're going to show you the video. We're going to show you just a portion of it where supposedly a guy found a camera and a microphone in his Magnavox Converter box. Now, this is one of those boxes that you get when uh, you don't have cable and you don't have satellite, and they're going to change the uh, they're, they're going to change what's being broadcast over the airways from an analog signal to a digital one. And there's been a lot of talk about this high definition television, how it was a new world order plot, and I don't know that. I haven't seen the evidence on it. But anyway, some guy with his camera on opens up his converter box, and he claims to find a microphone and a camera embedded is in his converter box. Take a look at it. So I bought one of these digital converter TV boxes. I actually bought two of them. And I had a friend that uh, was trying to tell me that they put cameras in these things. That, uh, you know, that you set it on your TV and, and uh, you know, somebody, the government or whoever, has the ability to spy on you. And so what I did is I opened it up to prove them wrong, and uh, lo and behold, uh, this is a Magnavox unit, by the way, that was purchased at Walmart. Lo and behold, though, as you can see, 
right here is a camera unit. There's actually a, a uh, if I can focus here, a microphone. Um, here's the RF sensor. So not to confuse the camera for, you know, what you would use as a remote control. But clearly you can see this thing does in fact have both a camera and a microphone mounted. There's a microphone. Here's what I did. I happen to have one of these Magnavox converter boxes at home. We got the little government card. We got the discount. My wife said, go get it in case our satellite goes out. So I did. I've still got it in the box. And it just happened to be the exact same brand as this, what this guy had. It was a Magnavox. So I thought, well, I'm going to open this thing up. So I opened it up last night. Guess what I found? Nothing. I didn't find a camera. I didn't find a microphone secretly hidden in there. In fact, I had, tr I had trouble getting the thing back together. That's, that's my, my thing. I can take it apart easily. I just can't put it together very well. Anyway, got it back together and I hope it works. But I didn't find a camera and I didn't find a microphone in there. Here's what I want you to do. If you have a converter box, take the screws off the back, open it up, and see if there's a camera and a microphone in there. And if there are, send me pictures of it. If there's not, send me pictures of it anywhere. Or just send me an email at pastormike at kingjamescode.org and say, Pastor Mike, I opened my converter box and I did not find a camera and a microphone in there. You see, this thing originates from Alex Jones. At, well, I think it used to be Infowars.com. Now it's called Prison Planet. Anyway, he's promoting this thing as if it was true based upon one guy sending in a video. Now, my suspicion is, is that this guy planted a camera and a microphone in his Magnavox box to prove a point. And uh, I mean, there's all kinds of problems with this, which is the reason why I don't believe it. One of the things that you'll see from this program is that I have this idea that if it's not in the Bible, it doesn't exist. Now, I know that, that somehow, some way, the powers that be, that be are going to find a way to monitor all of us. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. But let's deal with reality and truth instead of trumped up lies. And so I'm going to put the call out to you. Open up your converter box. See if there's a camera and a microphone in there. Send me a picture of it. On our Obama Watch segment today, we have an article from World Net Daily. Uh, Obama ripped on sex agenda. Scholar says president following Kinsey's plan of sexual anarchy. A renowned expert on the life and work of sex scientist Alfred Kinsey, widely known as the father of the sexual revolution, is raising alarms over President Obama's pursuit of sex education for kindergartners. And his plans to install a pornography advocate, we dealt with that on this broadcast, in a top Justice Department position. Now, he's saying that Obama is promoting this idea of having such education in, in as small a classes as the kindergarten classes, all the way down to the kindergarten level, teaching kids about sex. Now, I don't have to tell you, and if you've got common sense, you'll know that this is inherently dangerous. But let's, here's a video clip, and here's, here's President Obama, before he was president, actually making fun of Alan Keyes, who said that Obama was going to try to get sex education in the kindergarten. Here's Obama making fun of Keyes for saying that, and then Obama saying that it has to happen. Take a look. I remember him uh, using this in a camp in his campaign against me saying Barack Obama supports uh, teaching sex education to kindergartners <laughs> and you know which I didn't know what to tell him um, <laughs> but but it's the right thing to do uh, it, you know it, it, uh, to, to provide age appropriate um, sex education science based sex education in the schools. You, as, as a peer, can have enormous power over uh, your age cohort. Now, I don't have to tell you that open discussion of sexuality in younger ages is totally out of line. I think it's immoral. I think it leads to promiscuity. I think not only promiscuity among, uh, among teenagers, but among children as well. I think that it is a bad idea to have male or female teachers talking about sex-related issues to five-year-old children. I think it's going to set up a very dangerous environment for your children. Let me give you an explanation of what I'm talking about. You've heard about the priest scandal, about how all these Catholic priests 
had been molesting all these boys and girls, usually boys, but sometimes girls as well. And you have to ask the question, how did the priest get in so close to these kids? And the answer is very simple. There was a book written in the mid-1800s by a Canadian Roman Catholic chief, priest called by the name of Charles Chiniqui. Charles Chiniqui came out of the Roman Catholic system, and he wrote a book called The Priest, the Woman, and the Confessional. And in this book, he detailed how all of these priests were using the confessional to lure women into them. Now, this is during the 1800s at the time. So here's what they would do. He said that pr the priest would get into the confessional, and here is one of the women of the community who would come in there, supposedly under the guise of secrecy, but the priest knew who this woman was. And then over time, this priest would get this woman to start opening up her most deepest secret thoughts. He, would, he was preying upon her inside the confessional getting her to talk dirty to him under the guise of confessing her sins. And Chiniqui said that before too long, this priest had so much power over these women, in some cases, these teenage women, he had so much power of them that it was just a matter of time before they were going to sleep together. And I think that a situation where adults are talking with teenagers or children about issues of sexuality, I think that's dangerous. I think that belongs specifically in the home environment with mom and dad. And I'm against it absolutely, totally. And you say, oh, that's not going to happen. Our teachers are trained professionals. Oh, really? How many articles are we seeing? In fact, there is a whole section on World Net Daily. And I encourage you to go there. A whole section on World Net Daily that deals with the number of female teachers that are molesting their male students, and in some cases, female students. And so I'm telling you, it is inherently dangerous, and Barack Obama, if he's promoting this, and he's going to, I think it's... See, this is, this is a throwback to the Clinton days. Clinton had Jocelyn Elders, the, the Surgeon General, who was, who was pr actively promoting a sex education agenda, a very pornographic sex education agenda in our public schools. And we're not just talking about heterosexuality. We're talking about sodomy that's going to be d discussed openly among students. And I, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want my kid sitting in a classroom with some guy or some woman who's talking about that thing. That's not right. But this is the stuff he's promoting. Here's another one. We've dealt with this uh, Obama issue as far as him being the Messiah. Here's a, uh, here's a poll Obama is America's number one hero, not Jesus. Uh, U.S. President Barack Obama has beaten Jesus Christ to be American's number one hero, according to a new Harris poll. The top 10 uh, list based on the poll showed Obama at number one position, Christ at number two, and Martin Luther King at number three. I don't have to tell you that the Ten Commandments say that our God is is a jealous God. God will never, ever allow himself to be played second fiddle or to play second fiddle to any one human being, including Barack Obama. One of our viewers sent me this. This is on the Church Watch segment. One of our viewers sent me this video from Next Level Church. We've dealt with them before. And that whole phrase, Next Level, is, is grossly New Age and New World Order oriented. And that's the kind of church they are. But take a look at this video of them promoting what they call a shot glass ministry. Take a look. Hi, I'm Todd Hahn, the lead pastor of Next Level Church in Charlotte. And I'm Robbie McLaughlin, I'm the campus pastor of our newest campus in Ballantyne. And uh, we just wanted to show up on YouTube today to say hey and to explain to uh, everyone that's interested why we're doing the Shot Glass Outreach deal that has uh, gotten a little bit of attention. Uh, here's the deal, and here's what we're going to do. We've got a commitment at Next Level Church to putting a Next Level campus very close to every exit off of I-485, which is the Belt Loop Highway that circles the city. And uh, we're going to do that within the next five to ten years. Our first stop is going to be in Ballantyne. And we're doing the shot glass outreach, which very simply, we're going into bars and restaurants in the Ballantyne area with a shot glass that has our logo on it and an invite card inside of it and uh, has the line on it, give us a shot, and handing those out to folks and handing those out to bar owners. We're doing that. seems a little controversial, but we're doing it for three reasons. The first one is this, our conviction that for thousands of years now, the church has been guilty of saying to folks, you know, we want you to come to us. 
instead of the church saying, we want to go to where you are. It's a really bad idea because Jesus' whole approach was going where people lived, going where they partied, going where they hung out, uh, going to the important events in their life, just showing up and being there. So we want to model Christ and be like Christ in that way. Uh, the second reason was that we want to be known and identified the same way that Jesus was, as a friend of partiers and uh, folks that the religious community would call sinners. We've read several passages of Scripture before that deal with this whole idea of Mystery of Babylon and how she has a cup in her hand and she makes the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication. And any time a church is dealing or trying to minister to people through shot glasses, that just indicates the kind of spirit that dwells inside of that church. It's not a Holy Spirit. It's not a spirit of sobriety, for crying out loud. And the Bible tells us to be sober. And anybody who tells you that you're to be drunk in the Holy Spirit of God, they're lying through their teeth. You need to go read the scriptures. But anyway, a shot glass ministry is indicative of the kind of spirit that exists in this and other churches. And you say, well, my church does Rick Warren, but they're not doing this. These guys are raising the bar, people. These guys are raising the bar and other churches are going to follow with the same type, the same type of situation or far worse. You watch and see if it doesn't happen. Here's another church. Somebody sent me Water's Edge Church, and here's their sermon series, Let's Get It On. Here again, another series from a church about sex. And all these, are they're following the same guidebook. They're all following the same protocols and how they're, how they're uh, reaching, so-called reaching out to people. And they're trying to do it through lasciviousness. And you cannot bring people to a spiritual awakening through, through Jesus Christ by, by uh, enticing them in the flesh. You can't do it. But here they are. Uh, here's the, I think it's the pastor. We have a video clip to show you. Here's the pastor, and I think his ministry staff, or his ministry team, they call it. And they're up on the stage, and they're, they're doing a rendition of this group, this rock group, New Kids on the Block. Uh, I think the song is Hanging Tough. This is a church service. Take a look at it. I'm sorry, I just, can't, I just can't see Peter and James and Paul and John doing this in Jerusalem. I just don't see it. The song is from New Kids on the Block. This is rock and roll. This is uh, what they call bubblegum rock. It was for teenage girls and so on. It's lasciviousness, by the way. And uh, the song they were singing is called Hanging Tough. Here, I found the lyrics of this song. It says, listen up, everybody. If you want to take a chance, just get on the floor and do the new kids dance. Don't worry about nothing because it won't take long. Watch this. We're going to put you in a trance with a funky song because you got to be hanging tough. There is definitely a new spirit flowing through these churches and it's being done through the music. And anybody that tells you that music is neutral... And it doesn't matter what kind of music you use, they're wrong. You see, and, and we've, I've dealt with this on several videos. What I found out was, is that the move to get churches away from the hymnals, away from the trusted old time songs, to this new contemporary Christian music was simply, the contemporary Christian music was a bridge to get churches into rock and roll. And that's exactly where these churches are. They're not doing the contemporary Christian music anymore. And they threw out the hymn books a long time ago. They're promoting rock and roll music. We have dealt with this in several videos, the Emerging Church and Rick Warren and, and um, the New Age Rick Warren and the Great Falling Away. We've dealt with that. And uh, I, I get a copy of those. Uh, the, uh, there's another video that we have called The Occult in Christian Music. And you can get those through our ministry. Just send us an email and we'll send them to you. But anyway, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was an attempt to get churches to get into rock and roll in the church. And it has no place in there. And that's exactly what's going on. Somebody sent me this. Is your church gay friendly? Uh, there's a website called gaychurch.org. 
Hmm. And uh, you can go there and click on your state. You can find a list of churches. We are in Missouri, so I clicked on Missouri, and it says 87 churches that are gay-friendly churches in America. If you look down the list there, in the St. Louis area, and we are about 30 miles south of St. Louis, so in the St. Louis area, God's Harbor Community Church. If, by, by the way, I've wanted to say this for a long time. If, you, if you're in a church and, it's, and, you're, and they change the name of your church to Community Church, get out. Okay, there's no good with these community churches. Grace, God's Harbor Community Church, Kirkwood Baptist Church. I already gave these guys a call, and I wonder if they know that they're on the list. Now, I'm, I don't know that these churches know that they're on this list. I don't know that for sure. And so you might want to give them a call and ask. You might want to go on there and find a church in your area and say, did you know that your church is on a gay? And what this is, it's a gay rights organization that says if you're queer, if you're a sodomite, you can go to this church. And, and I'm assuming that they're saying that they won't say anything about you being gay. And I think that's dangerous. I think that's terrible. Look at what the Bible says. Romans chapter 1, verse 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The Bible spells it out very clearly that homosexuality, sodomy, lesbianism, transgendered, all of these things, they represent God turning someone over to a reprobate mind. And I, and I don't know that everybody who's like this is irretrievable, uh, but I do know that probably a vast majority are. And it indicates that God has taken people and turned them over to a reprobate mind. That's the danger of, that homosexuality poses in our society today. But the biggest danger, it, probably an even greater danger than that, is the passive way that it's being dealt with from the pulpits of this country. It needs to be preached on. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be condemned because it is a condemnable act. And any pastor who will not touch this because he knows that people are going to be offended by this. Or or maybe it's worse than that. In fact, we know because of Ted Haggard, we know that there's probably guys and women in the pulpit right now that are closet homosexuals that are looking to promote homosexuality to, uh, I guess, open up a new venue for them. I don't know. But anyway, the Bible gives a strong warning that not only, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, that God thinks this is despicable. But look at verse 32, the same chapter. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And the Bible is very clear. We cannot take a passive uh, stance on this issue. We have to stand strong. We have to, we have to come out and, and call sin, sin, and sinners, sinners. And does it matter if they're homosexuals? It doesn't matter if they're just shacking up, which is what most people are doing nowadays. It doesn't matter if they're just fornicating or anything like that. We have to take a strong and active stand in these last days against these things because it is a sin against the very body of Christ. Paul said that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and that we are the temple of God and that we are the body of Christ. And there's one sin that is a sin against the body. And that's the sin of fornication. These things need to be talked about, dealt with. These things need to be repented of. We've, we're moving into our, I think this is our seventh broadcast, close to 20,000 views of our broadcast. Thank you so much for that. And I almost guarantee you that those watching, many of those watching, have been or are guilty of some type of sin of fornication or lasciviousness. And the time now, folks, is to repent. The time is now to repent of those things. In our email segment, I got this email the other day, and it was such a blessing to me. And I read this email to our church, and we prayed for you, Ricky. Uh, Ricky is a woman in the Netherlands, and uh, she writes to us, Dear Pastor Mike, I heard this evening your study, Invasion Part 1, and I'm very pleased that you're so straight in your teachings and Bible explanation. I learned, again, very much. 
Although I live in Europe and not in the USA, I can see how everything develops in a certain direction towards that new world order. It frightens me that few people want to hear about it. The scriptures tell us that we are not of this world. We live in it and have to spread the gospel to those who still want to listen, but we cannot party with the world. God bless you for that. As I told you, I'm a widow since four years. I'm 61 years and without a church where I can go to. That is very sad. I miss community, support, love, and understanding. Nothing of that at all. Since I am a widow, nobody will come. Nobody has the slightest idea how lonely you can be. But we'll survive thanks to the power of the Holy Spirit and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm tired of seeking a place I can go to. There are so many churches. But one church has, for instance, two pastors, husband and wife, and both pastors. And the wife initiated her own husband. Isn't that wrong? It is wrong, Ricky. You're right. Other churches will marry two men or two women. There I cannot go either. Other churches do not believe in God, although they use his name and use the same words as before. But when you talk with them about the Lord, you soon find out that they do not believe anymore in the Son of God. They look at you as if you are completely crazy. Ricky, your sentiments, I guarantee it. People who are watching this broadcast feel the exact same way that you do. She says, so it is very wearying to find a church that preaches the Bible right. I'm no longer in a position, nor financial, nor otherwise, to drive along the country and hope that I will find a community. I have no energy left. For that reason, I feel often very lonely. No work, not much financial income, and no brothers and sisters around. That is the most frightening thing. I also grieve over the death of my husband. We had such a strong love, and we prayed and studied together. We were married for more than 38 years. Well... I hope you will say a little prayer for me. Ricky, we did. God bless you. If I lived in USA, Missouri, I surely would visit your church. Thank you in advance for your prayer, Brother Mike. Your sister in Christ Jesus, Ricky. This, like I say, is a woman from the Netherlands. And and, uh, I want you to pray for her because her situation may be like your situation. Without a church, without a place to go. And uh, we are providing this broadcast for you, for people that... Uh, cannot go to a church anymore because they're using the wrong Bibles, because they're using Rick Warren, because they're doing gay marriages, because of the, because of the music, because of all of these issues. And uh, our church, we pray for you. We love you. And we thank you for making this broadcast what you've made out of it. We want you to keep watching, keep contributing, keep helping us along. And we appreciate everybody that sends us these encouraging emails. And uh, pray for one another. The church... It's not just located in this building. The church is all over the world and God knows who they are. And God is separating out his people in these last days. And we want to encourage you with that. That's why we want to keep this broadcast going as long as we can. We have two new videos out that uh, you may not have heard of. One is called Jesus Christ DNA and the Holy Bible. And the other one is a brand new series that I started called Understanding Prophecy. And the first part of that is Understanding Direct Prophecies. Now, these videos for the time being, for, for a few months, are only available through cuttingedge.org. We made an arrangement with them and they sell and promote our newest videos for, for just a, a, a small amount of time. And then after that, we give them away. Why are we doing this? Well, to me, it's very simple. And I've told you many times that we're a small church. We're not very big. We average about 50 people. We're trying to grow in this community and we're trying to reach out. But there's just so many churches that are doing so many things right now. And it's just capturing everybody's attention. And it's difficult for us. And God allows us to do this ministry literally, literally cost-free. It doesn't cost us anything to put out this broadcast. It doesn't cost anything for me to sit in front of this camera and to talk, talk, talk and, and do all these things that we do and put out these videos. So we're a small church. And for years, we operated a, a Christian school and a daycare center here. And that helped us pay, pay our bills. And I didn't have to worry about money, didn't have to worry about finances or anything like that. We weren't making a lot of money, but we were paying our bills. But in December and January, the Lord uh, spoke to us. And, and we all agreed as a church that it was time to close these things down. And so now we operate simply on the tithes and offerings of those who attend our church. One of my biggest concerns, and I'm just going to share my heart, and I hope that you understand where I'm coming from. One of my biggest concerns, of course, you know, if, if you've read our blogs in the past, that my wife deals with precancerous tissue. And uh, she's, had, she's had several uh, lumpectomies. She's had, uh, so far, the readings have been good. But we know that the cancer cells are there, and at some point they may manifest themselves. My primary concern for our church is that we pay 
my wife's health insurance. That's what the, the bills are going to rack up, and we know that those things are going to happen. And I've been very careful on this broadcast or on any video uh, to beg people for money because that just reeks of everything that everybody else is doing, and I won't do that. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and He will provide. But I felt like sharing the need with you and sharing why we do what we do here and the fact that we're not out for your money. We're not, I'm not trying to buy a new car. I drive a 1992 uh, Chevy Lumina back and forth here to the church every day. And uh, I'm not about money because money ruins things. But if you could help us, go to cuttingedge.org, purchase the videos that we have there. We get a, a, a portion of your sales from there. Or you can just simply say, Pastor Mike, We'd like to contribute once a month, once a week, once a year. It doesn't really matter to us. You can, if you like, donate several ways. You can send us something uh, just through the mail. Uh, we have a PayPal account. It's trustworthy, and several of you have uh, availed yourself of that, and we certainly appreciate it. And like I say, I, I'm, we're not about money here, uh, but just help us along. And I promise you that God will give you a great reward. Now, I'm not going to be one of these guys that say, now you're going to get $1,000 or God's going to pay off your house. I couldn't make that kind of promise. But uh, be, be part of what God is doing. Send, pray for us. And send us, send us, keep sending us your emails and your comments. Be watchmen on the wall uh, and, and kind of look for these things and help me along. I don't have to do a lot of research on this stuff because people are sending me all this stuff and it just makes it easy. It makes it fun. And I enjoy hearing from you. But anyway, you can get our videos, and if you request videos, we'll send them to you free of charge. That is not going to change. And, and once the uh, time limits are up with these new videos, then we're going to offer them free of charge as well. But just keep us in mind. Keep us in your prayers, and, and hopefully uh, you can keep us in your support as well. We love you. We thank God for you. We want to keep ministering to you as best as we can. And uh, we hope to see you all soon, uh, if not here on this earth, but one of these days in heaven. This is Pastor Mike saying we love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.